My name's Pete Ring. My background is military aviation in fighters and helicopters. These chats I do with people are supported by and in the interest of the Air Force Association, Wings Magazine and our Wings Australia YouTube channel. If you like these videos, please support us by at the end of the video going to the description and subscribing to our mate, subscribing to our channel, but at the same time, please um, think about whether you might subscribe to Air Force Association New South Wales or subscribe to Wings Magazine, which is a premium magazine, aviation magazine, that is getting a lot of attention from aviation um, specialists and people who love to read uh, stories about um, the future of aviation. So this morning, we're talking to John Quaife, a familiar name, <laughs> if you've watched some of our videos. Uh, I want to, again, today, I want to uh, use John's experiences in the Mirage and in the F-18 to base our discussion. So welcome, John. Thank you, Peter. So can you just you just recover for people watching your experience in Mirage and in uh, the F eighteen? Um, yeah, yeah, sure, Peter. Um, I uh, I reckon I had the good fortune of timing in that I uh, pitched up in the Air Force towards the end of the Mirage era, era and so I got to fly. Uh, the Mirage towards the end of its service. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I ended up with, I don't know, 700. And, in fact, I do know, I do know, I researched this, 777, which is a really good number of hours for a bloke who used to be CA 77. For, <laughs> anyway, anyway, so 777 Mirage hours, but about double that. Uh, flying the classic Hornet. So I went through the transition. Um, so, you know, saw the, uh, you, know, it's, you know, tent platforms tend to get better as they go along, saw the Mirage at its best and saw the Hornet in the early days, which was great. That's good. Oh, and I stayed on, you know, in a fairly senior career. So I did watch the um, Hornet as it uh, developed over the years, but I'll probably, in, you know, confine my thoughts and, and comments to the early days. Good one. When you look at, which we're going to do now, the Mirage in its ground attack role and the Hornet in its mm. ground attack role, what was the biggest thing that struck you in the comparison between a Mirage and a and a Hornet? Um, yeah, there, there's probably going to be older Mirage guys and I that will uh, rail at this description, but the Mirage to me always felt a little bit like it was a uh, a fighter with an air to ground capability tacked on. You know, it didn't really seem to be an air to mud machine to me. In fact, you know, it's such a pretty interceptor, a, a magnificent looking fast straight line machine. What the hell were they thinking? You know, putting bombs on this thing. Um, <laughs> The, the bit where they might rail is um, what I'm gaffing off there, kissing off there, is the fact that I'm, I'm aware, and don't know the details of it, but I'm aware the Mirage first came into Australian service as a uh, fighter aircraft, but there, you know, there was this idea of a air-to-surface variant that was introduced somewhere along the line. Now, to me, that's all uh, obscure because by the time I got there, the Mirages were all identical across the fleet. I think that might have been, you know, you might even be able to correct me here, Ringo, if you know, um, that the advent of an air-to-surface variant was the introduction of an air-to-ground radar capability on the Serrano, perhaps, you right. know, more than anything else. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, so um, I, I'll stand by it. You know, basically, um, the Mirage was a fighter aircraft that, oh, by the way, could drop bombs if you put bombs on it and gave it a few systems in support of that. Um, and that's that's not... That's not too different to a lot of other fighters over the years. You know, my mind goes to things like um, 
uh, Kitty Hawks, for example, that were basically designed as a fighter, but geez, they did a pretty good job in ground attack roll through the Second World War. Um, so it's not unknown to be this idea of throwing bombs on a fighter uh, to get a uh, you know a, ta a tactical attack capability out of it. Um, but where I'm going with this is the Hornet was designed from the ground up to be a strike aircraft. Um, it was also designed from the ground up to be a fighter aircraft. So um, the the marching orders uh, around the uh, design team that came up with the Hornet design was the idea of an aircraft that could um, uh, replace the Phantom in an air-to-air -air role for the US Navy and also replace the Corsair uh, in the attack role. And so what you get is out of that mix comes an aircraft with a admittedly compromised radar, but is the weapon system, but a bloody good air-to-air -air radar, as we discussed when we were talking air-to-air -air weapons, uh, but a really good air-to-surface radar that can be the heart of a ground attack system. And the, all the facilities, including um, uh, smart uh, sighting systems and the like, to facilitate the employment of weapons. Uh, so... I sort of saw the, um, um, you know, and, and that all gets summed up by the name, doesn't it? So FA-18 Hornet, you know, fighter attack, you know, so front, right from the outset, it was meant to be this uh, compromised aircraft and did a good job. Okay, so in a Mirage, if you were delivering 500,000 pound bombs, that's just in a Mirage. I, I never had, by the way, you threw me there with the thousand pound. I don't recall ever having thousand pound, you know, weapons off the Mirage, but you, you probably could. But you know, it was all for me. It was all five hundred pounds. Okay, all my that's fine. Yes, yeah. um, doesn't matter. Um, sort of, you know, comes into the point a bit. But essentially, what we were doing was roaring around at low level, uh, which was, you know, the the tactic of the day to infiltrate an integrated air defence system. So in other words, you know, sneak in below the radar uh, uh, to then deliver, um, uh, you know, basically visually guided, you know, so basically a, a, a site solution managed by the pilot uh, to, you know, drop a dumb weapon or drop a laser guided weapon, uh, but somebody else needed to be holding the laser because it wasn't going to be in the mirage. So that that what that meant, the end game of the roaring around at low level was typically a pop-up attack to acquire the target to roll in, uh, dive, bomb the target. Uh, variations on that theme were what were flown. Um, and, and, and another variation that was enabled by the laser-guided weapon was you could toss your bomb at the target. Basically, um, all you really had to do was uh, throw the bomb and hopefully have it land in, in a, a, an imaginary basket uh, that could uh, enable the bomb to see uh, the, the reflection of a laser spot and be able to guide to it. Um, so that was range, what sort of range did you lob it from? Um, a few miles. I don't know. I've got my book. I won't bore you with the details, oh, but a few oh. miles. So it was really, you know, so the idea being that you could pull up, um, you know, an enormous amount of bloody um, mandrolic calculations were behind yeah. this, I might yeah. add, Ringo, because this, yeah. this is all pre-computers, yeah. where you know, you'd release it as you passed, you know, at a certain range at a certain G, you'd pull up and passing a certain height, you'd pickle them off the bombs would leave the aircraft. You could then, you know, roll aggressively away from the target, pull hard and not go, in theory, not go uh, into uh, the weapons envelope of AAA that might have been, you know, kind of located with the target. So a few more is the idea. So then you, the F-18 came along, F-A-18. Yeah. Uh, and how did that change the profile? Interestingly, um, uh, and, and I knew our conversation would take me here, so no risk of that, but it did not take it as far away from that profile as you might imagine. Um, and But we got there. We got there in the end game. I, I, I believe that um, one of the things that uh, held the Hornet back was a, a failure of the system to almost realise what they had 
in the uh, in the FA eighteen. Um, the system knew what it had with the Mirage, i.e., a fighter that you could uh, you could tack bombs onto, and it tended to regard the the Hornet as another one of those, and it could get away with that because the F one eleven was on the scene, right? And the F one eleven was the primo air to surface machine. And so, therefore, if you look at uh, the weapons that the uh, F-111 typically carried, which typically was uh, Mark 82s or Mark 84s, so 500-pound uh, or 2,000-pound general-purpose bombs or variation thereof with laser guidance, um, what the Hornet carried was the same. Um, so there was no... Uh, that was, if you like, that was the RAF's bombing inventory or inventory of bombs. And so uh, the, there was no um, uh, a concession made or deliberate sort of thinking behind what might be the best weapon to arm the Hornet. Because quite frankly, in those early days, the Mark 83 1,000 pound bomb, which caused me to ah, pick up when you said that uh, earlier, was probably the the, the weapon in terms of a general purpose bomb, most aptly fit for the F-18, but we didn't get them. Uh, similarly, when um, the uh, first guys went off to the States to learn about Hornets, they learned a lot about uh, harm. And uh, even in the early days, we're learning a lot about Maverick. Um, Maverick's a TV guided air to surface missile, uh, harm is a anti-radiation missile and uh, Maverick, not so much, but certainly harm got mentioned in the government's press releases of the day. So uh, the Air Force and certainly the fighter community figured we were getting harm. And so there, a lot of effort had gone into training for harm. And when the guys turned back up in Australia with their training packages and syllabus and the like, uh, they were teaching harm tactics with the expectation that what this would enable would be a little bit of a revolution in how we were going to go to war. Um, because we could now expect with harm in the inventory to use that weapon to suppress enemy defensive systems that would give us a lot more freedom than having to scurry around, you know, like cockroaches at low level to then pop, you know, frantically pop up and drop a weapon and scurry away again. So, you know, it had the potential to change things. But guess what? Uh, the government never bought harm. So we didn't do that. So it consigned us to be, uh, in a lot of ways, a platform that looked very similar in terms of how it went about its air to surface business as the Mirage except we would carry, could carry, Mark 84s. Um, but otherwise, we were dropping dumb bombs off a smart jet, uh, occasionally dropping them laser-guided. But even though there was a uh, expectation, again, that the Hornet would have a FLIR pod, they did not arrive straight away. And when they did arrive, they came in smaller numbers than a fleet-wide fit which uh, introduced some problems, which we can talk about later if you like. But, you know, basically we didn't depart weapons-wise too far from the Mirage. Hmm, interesting. So when did that, what year do you think that evolved? Uh, uh, I, yeah, I know when it started to go. Um, it was, uh, what year? It was when, it was when we were, when we went to Iraq. So the first time that the uh, classic Hornet went into combat, and this was the fight that saw the demise of Saddam Hussein. So uh, yeah. someone smarter at putting years to events can do that. Um, uh, that, that deployment, uh, by that stage, I'd finished my operational flying, but I was um, a commander of the group. And um, so we put the guys from essentially a, a 75 squadron augmented went off to uh, participate in that in that fight. And uh, I can tell you that the uh, the limb fact on the utility of the Hornet as an air to surface machine became the FLIR pod. Uh, I didn't mention it. I said it. We can talk about that later. Maybe I need to talk about that a little. But um, we were poorly served by uh, that approach to um, 
And essentially, it's that fitted for but not with approach that Australia has been guilty of doing, um, you know, for a number of years. The idea that um, you you so this idea that yeah, okay, so the the Hornet can carry harm missiles, so therefore we think we've got a harm capability, or the Hornet can carry a flirt pod, so therefore we think it's got a forward-looking infrared capability. But unless you got the platform, unless you got the piece of kit. And unless you habitually train with the piece of kit, you won't know how it works, what its limitations are and all that sort of stuff. And, and we didn't actually fully uh, exploit or depend on the FLIR pod until we went into that combat operation and the bloody pod let us down. We, we got there, but it was a, a near run thing. Uh, you might recall that was a fairly short, sharp deployment of aircraft. Yeah. Uh, I think it was like three months, something like that. And so we said, hey, we're going for three months. And then much to everyone's surprise at three months point, we came home. You know, great. War was won. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, out of there. Um, but that three-month period basically coincided, you know, with the last flow pod drop, toppling off its perch being unserviceable, that sort of stuff, which was uh, quite sobering. Uh, for those of us in the fighter force, it was like, holy shit, we really do need uh, a replacement fluor pod and we really need to think about uh, how we train with this thing and we need to step up to a, uh, a different level because uh, all of our experience in that fight had been medium level releases. There was no scurrying around at low level and popping up to you know, deliver weapons visually. You know, those tactics were gone. And mm -hmm. those tactics have been gone ever since uh, for the Royal Australian Air Force. That is not the way we do business, which is, you know, sadly, again, one of the uh, key reasons why um, the utility of the F-111, you know, glorious platform as it, as it was and is, and everyone loves it and all that sort of stuff, shedding tears, what have you. Uh, but nonetheless, it had reached its use-by date tactically in terms of uh, uh, what utility that, that platform had on the mo in the modern battle space. Hmm. Very interesting. Did did um did the amount of weapons you could carry on the FA eighteen change much in the way that you approach targets? Except I'm 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 thinking more like you're very constrained in the Mirage and and uh, and, and the Mirage had I believe, and you can confirm this. Um, supersonic tanks that was a, a bomb carrier as well. And yeah. that was the later days of the Mirage, did the new weapon configuration of the FA-18 give any more um, rewards to the capability of the actual aeroplane? Yeah, it did. Um, so the RPK-10s were the, funnily how things pop into your head, were the um, supersonic tanks with the bomb racks on them. Um, yeah, it did. The, the biggest thing I mentioned, uh, so um, the weapons in the inventory, uh, sadly, did not change with the advent or with the change from Mirage to Hornet. Uh, but what did change was accuracy. So while whilst we were still delivering uh, dumb bombs from the smart jet, we were delivering them from a jet that gave you really quite high confidence that the weapons that you were releasing were we're going to go somewhere pretty damn close to the target. Um, so precision was the thing that changed, Pete, more than um, uh, weapons loadout. Um, similar, I'd say similar weapons loadout, uh, but uh, but the Hornet had, was a far more forceful proposition. And the reason I say that is um, because the uh, classic Hornet came with an air-to-air refueling capability, which allowed you to... Um, think more forcefully about force projection. You know, you were no longer constrained by the limited range of, um, you know, essential, what were essentially range-limited interceptor aircraft that were carrying bombs. Uh, you now had a fair income bomb carrier in terms of um, the support systems to enable accurate delivery uh, and a slightly enhanced bomb load, but certainly uh, through the auspices of air refueling, you could take this thing almost, you know, clearly constrained with uh, with other factors, but almost wherever you wanted to. So what was the profile of a, maybe in the Middle East, a typical um, bombing ground attack mission? What was the 
general profile from takeoff to using tankers to delivering weapons or to uh, to be in holding patterns? What was a typical um, profile? Yeah, look, invariably, um, it so it would involve, it depends, you know, so there was the first Gulf deployment, and then there was the later ones, which were slightly different, but similar. Um, uh, I think the later ones were a little bit further away, but, you know, so it would be, in, it would involve whatever domestic tanking was required to get the aircraft into the area of operation, right? So that could be, you know, if you're based a fair way away, that could be a, uh, a tanking evolution at top of climb uh, with another tank prior to entering the airspace, or it could be, uh, you know, just launch from your base, but you'd hit a tanker prior to entering the airspace. So when you went into the area of operations, you were going in uh, with fuel and um, full fuel. You would then uh, go through and do your business um, and uh, then typically you, you could fuel again if doing that business was you remaining on station and being on call to deliver your weapons, and you could do that a number of times, right, if if you needed to, um, and then typically you'd tank again before coming uh, home. Now, the profile in that first war against Saddam Hussein, the profiles that the guys flew were basically every variation of air-to-surface that um, uh, you know, aficionados of the RAF Air Power Manual would recognise, all right? Um, so the the guys flew everything from, uh, you know, the pre-planned strike mission where everything is known before you launch and you know you're going to hit this particular target, you know the details of the target, you've got weapons to target matching done, et cetera, et cetera, and it's all you know, thought out, and I now go and fly that profile, deliver the weapons, destroy the target, come home for tea and bicky, so strike, um, to um, interdiction, and the and, and in, in, in fact, battlefield interdiction, where, and here there was sort of some innovation flown and developed in the, in the Gulf War, where uh, basically... Uh, if you've got the knowledge of where all the good guys are, you can basically say, okay, and 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 typically what they were using to control this would be grid squares. So you would you'd be assigned a couple of grid squares on a map that were known to be free of good guys, which meant you could patrol that area, and if you found bad guys, you could have Adam, right? And so that became a very powerful way of controlling. Um, the movement of Saddam Hussein's army and sort of resupply sort of uh, capabilities, um, which is your classic battle area interdiction. So you're not involved in the direct fight of the guys on the ground, but you're having an enormous influence on it mm. just outside of that, uh, of that mm. battle area. And then getting closer, uh, the guys flew close air support missions too, when they were working uh, directly in response to targets that were being called by the guys on the ground. Um, so working back through their controlling agencies to coordinate the delivery of a weapon uh, right where uh, a weapon was desperately needed by the guys that were fighting the fight at the time. So basically, like I said, the um, the, the classic Hornet flew the full gamut of, of air-to-surface type missions uh, that can be flown. The I guess a restriction on it, the um, uh, the Allies had so much air power that getting your hands on a strike target was a bit difficult uh -huh. uh, because, you know, you imagine you've got a lot of B-1s in theatre or whatever, B-52s or whatever, you've got a lot of um, uh, capability for working your way through. And, and, you know, strike, that notion of it being pre-planned meant that not only is it pre-planned, but you've actually got a list. You know, there's a list somewhere, which is the in uh, in technical terms, it's the Joint Integrated Prioritised Target List, but it's a list of things that you want to hit, you know. And so uh, you, you're basically dishing out those targets to your strike platforms. And if you've got a lot of strike platforms, it can be pretty hard to, uh, to get hold of a decent strike uh, target. Um, so it didn't happen that often, but it did happen that the uh, Classic Hornets flew strike.
So did you find that the uh, air-to-air refueling added complexity to your fuel management to the degree that either the systems you had on board helped you to un to re uh, compute the um, flexibility that fuel gave you, or did you find that was a manual thing in your head? No, no never manual. Um, uh, yeah, just just look at me, Ringo. Do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> do you reckon I'm capable of that? Uh, no, uh, no, no, never manual. So all all um, fuel management and all that sort of stuff is was done uh, for you by by the machine. So. Um, if you're thinking about the Mirage to Hornet comparison, you know, bloody hell. I the in fact I told the story in the classic Hornet book. Oh, which by the way, it's sitting on the shelf, classic Hornet book. Um the early days, the Mirage 2000, I think it was, was a contender for uh the Mirage 3 replacement when we were looking at Hornets and F-16s. And the the French I believe quite proudly told the uh, project team. You'll, you'll love this jet. It's got the same fuel system as the Mirage 3, ah. which everyone just went, oh, no, <laughs> because the bloody Mirage 3 fuel system was so convoluted. You'll recall yeah. that it had transfer levels, you know, so the uh, fuel gauges in the cockpit um, did not tell you, uh, you know, what, what fuel quantity you had in the external tanks. You had to uh, watch the, you know, the fuel gauges would, would drop down <laughs> to a level at which, transfer from your tanks commenced and meanwhile there's a debit meter that's counting up the numbers so you'd have to watch and when they dropped off that level that meant that you'd got all the fuel out of the tanks well you had to do some mental gymnastics to figure out whether did i get all my fuel yeah. um so and that happened about three times through the yeah. uh consumption of your total fuel the hornet no problem and you could even just go you know um uh, you could do, you know, just go, I want to go to this waypoint and it would tell you how much fuel you're going to have when you got there, you know. So all the, um, it's like like driving these days with the uh, benefits of your, um, your onboard computer in your car, you know. it's uh, It was very easy to do that cockpit management of those sort of domestic tasks. So did GPS become... Um... A big factor in the navigation system, or or did it? How, what what yeah. was largely used to track your position? Yeah, uh, you you might. This I find this you know amazing how quickly things change and how quickly you get used to stuff. But the classic Hornet, when it first came into service, did not have GPS. Um, it had it had twin inertials, which. Um, did it have twin inertials? It might have had, it might have, it's sort of an internal backup system, maybe not quite twin inertial in the airliner sense of a twin inertial. Um, but, you know, a good inertial navigation platform was the bee's knees in those days. And the Mirage did not have one. No. You know, the Mirage had the, was it the precision homing indicator, I think was, I, I don't, I'm struggling to remember what it was called because all of us just called it the pure horseshit indicator. Uh, so I'm, I don't forget what PHI actually stood for, but it was very rudimentary. and homing indicator. Yeah, there you go. a very rudimentary thing that kind of um, uh, sort of measured sort of where you were around a, uh, like a grid sort of thing that could give you, an, you know, I think, you know, maybe home is that way and it's that many miles and it wasn't very accurate, as as you recall. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we had a very good inertial system, but one of the very first things that happened in terms of a long series of upgrades of the classic Hornet was the introduction of GPS capability. Uh, and it started with, you know, an expectation that we'll get a GPS box which very quickly became a, no, you won't, you'll get a GPS card for the INS to then become, no, you won't, you, all you really need is a chip on that card. Uh, and so it very much became, you know, an embedded capability in the jet very quickly. Wow. And the advent of GPS brought with it. Um, so uh, I mentioned the fact that we were flying those uh, F-111, if you like, era weapons uh, in the early days of the classic Hornet. So we've, we, you know, by the time of um, that first operational deployment, we were already self-designating from what was a fairly shitty uh, FLIR pod 
that quickly got replaced with a more capable flare pod, the Lightning uh, pod, as part of the Hornet upgrades. Uh, but also, uh, we were, from that point on, evolving weapons capabilities. So not only were we dropping laser-guided, but we started dropping uh, GPS-guided weapons uh, to eventually the, uh, the, the latest era of uh, JDAM weaponry as that got developed. And, and interestingly, again, uh, you know, a fun fact, not, not particularly well known, uh, but the Australian uh, Hornet fleet became uh, fleet leaders for a lot of the um, integration of the advanced JDAM weapons uh, through our own Indigenous software development capability. So what was happening, particularly in that last period of um, uh, the last period of operational deployment to the Middle East, um, new weapons would be released with um, uh, new software variants and the like. Well, those weapons and the software would go straight into theatre to go into the jets, but the software would also come to Australia uh, to be uh, uh, have the validation and integration needed to go into the uh, OFP for the aircraft from which they could cut a uh, new operational flight program that could then go to the Middle East. And we were getting... Uh, you know, it's like being the first kids on the block to have the latest version of Windows on your computer. You know, we were able to do that in Australia with the classic Hornet fleet. It's pretty impressive. Wow. So, so one, we're getting near the end here because I'm uh, I'm conscious of the time. But yep. when we dropped iron bombs, we practiced with iron bombs. So we yeah. had a a bomb that um, simulated an iron bomb, and we went out and dropped it in a circuit on a range. How does that evolve? How does that? How does your weapon training now for the well, even not now because of the F thirty five, but during the classic yeah. time, how did the the uh, smart weapons evolve in the sense of you doing some um, bombing training? How did how did they yeah, right. integrate? Yeah. Okay. So the the Hornet had two. Um, weapon aiming systems that were basically um, uh, using the same information, but it was just a question of how information was presented to the pilot, right? So with the uh, accurate knowledge of where you were, courtesy of the inertial or the GPS system, um, the uh, accurate uh, um, uh, target location information in courtesy of either a, either a navigation designation or radar designation or FLIR feeding accurate information or indeed even visual. So when I'm looking through and I'm actually designating a particular point visually, so th those very accurate inputs to the weapon system would be turned back to the pilot as either a display which said, if you drop a bomb now, this is where it's going to hit, which was... Uh, CCIP, so continuously computed impact point. So in other words, you were carting a little cross around in the HUD, which said, if you drop a weapon now, that's where it's going to hit. Uh, and so all you had to do was, or all you had to do, all you had to do was manipulate, manipulate that site picture over the point on the ground where you wanted it to hit. Yep. So that's uh, uh, a little bit like conventional bombing, but basically with you know, you, you know, the death dot accuracy of the CCIP cross because that's where it's where the aircraft knows the bomb is going to hit because it knows all this other stuff, right? Um, that was one methodology. The other was described as auto, which was uh, where, again, with all that knowledge, you could say, well, actually, I want to hit that point. And so you'd tell the jet, that's the point I want to hit. And so instead of providing you the symbology that said where a bomb will hit now, it now provided you symbology said, well, if you want to hit that point, then you need to fly over here. So you got fly two solutions that would take you to that point. And when you got to that point, the bomb would fall off all of its own because you'd said, I want to hit that point, right? So therefore you must want to hit that point, bomb falls off. So that was auto, right? So that, that describes a... Um, I think to uh, the novices, it was like, oh, you're doing, you know, this business of uh, practicing 
uh, iron bomb weapon releases, I don't need to do that anymore because, you know, the jet's so smart, it's doing all this stuff for me. However, what neither of those um, uh, uh, two systems really took into account was um, uh, things like uh, a minimum altitude that you might choose to be at when you drop a particular weapon because you don't want to fly through the frag envelope of that weapon or a particular dive angle that you want to release the weapon from because you want a specific um, you want a specific effect uh, on the target when the bomb arrives and I can only get that if I can get it to arrive steep or I get it to arrive shallow that sort of stuff and and there would be more so there would be more things like uh, uh, oh, certainly speed and height considerations in terms of how you might want to arrive at that release point that demanded that you give the jet a bit of help right so you had to get familiar with being able to manipulate a dive angle or manipulate a release height, which meant that we were not released from the drudgery of having to uh, fly patterns on Saldash range to build up an awareness of or an understanding of the site picture. And I might add, I've described it as, uh, as a wonderfully automated system, but essentially if you gave the jet a hand, by being a bit smooth with how you flew it, you'd get a much better result in terms of uh, accuracy out mm -hmm. of the aircraft. So yeah, we, we still had to do a lot of um, manual dumb bomb uh, practice to be become very good smart bombers, if you like. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, because I, I started to think there that maybe the simplicity was uh, climb to 8,000 feet, roll into a 45 degree dome, get the side on the target, press the button and recover. Mirage, yeah. Faber, probably a kitty hawk. But then now you're talking about a more complex uh, or, or, or a more numerous availability of profiles with yeah. more weight on the pilot to deliver on that profile. But on the other hand, um, it provides a much more um, accurate weapon delivery. Yeah, I, I might add, you know, the, uh, the 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 more recent operations in the Middle East where uh, guys were working in support of uh, terminal attack controllers, so typically close air support was what they were doing. Um, but, you know, it was the sort of thing where, um, uh, you know, it was this was a battle against the ISIS guys um, where um, you're working with a security agency on the ground where they might say, okay, so we've got a sniper who's operating from this building uh, and uh, there's a lot, I'm going to curtail this story a bit, but you know, there's a lot of background work goes on to ensure that the rules of engagements are cleared and all that sort of stuff before you can let one rip. But essentially what the pilot could do would just be able to take that data uh, and it could be, um, and without getting into details, it could be automatically take that data or manually enter that data uh, and basically tell the tell the smart bomb that's where I want you to go and let her rip, and the uh, the weapon would uh, basically look after it. So it could be done you know, in terms of what you are flying. Uh, the weapon could be released from just straight and level medium altitude, and uh, it would hit the target precisely. Mm. Okay, I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty impressive stuff. Uh, impressive to the point where, you know, frankly, perhaps slightly boring. Slightly boring. <laughs> uh, I could tell you another story about that too, but I won't. Maybe that's another time. Um, because I don't, I believe in life, once you've done something long enough, it gets a bit routine. And even, <clears throat> even talking to uh, racing car drivers, you know, the highest level of racing car driving, they suggest, yes, when you're actually driving, it's a, it's a tough gig. But yeah. the actual whole process gets to the just a routine. I'm just a uh, yeah, guy, look, right? and I'm, I'm being flippant, but you know, I, I'm aware of the fact. So I mentioned before about strike targets being hard to come by. In those more recent years of yeah. operations in the Middle East, there were very few strike targets. But when they came up, the guys loved to get them because what it did was it meant they had to apply all their learning and skills yeah. to developing their tactics. You know, as opposed to. I just wait for the guy to tell me where I want it and pickle it off. So a forward air control is still a factor in weapon delivery? Yeah, they, they're, they're called JTACs these days. Okay. Um, but, yep, yeah, same concept and absolutely so. Okay, um, thank you. And um, uh, 
if you if you want to know how it works, it's just let your mind run loose on the idea of a, an internet of things in terms of what you might be able to do with the transfer of data and the automated transfer of data and automated communications and the like. And you'll be starting to think of some ideas as to how the JTAC of today might be doing his business, his or her business. Yeah, good one. Well, I've got to thank you again for your frankness and your um, your uh, responsiveness to the questions. and. And a bit, a bit, I like the humour you can put into life because if you're doing something as serious as what you're doing or practice to do something as serious as what, as what military pilots and military people are doing, you need the sense of humour to counterbalance what you're being asked to do. Probably. Yeah, because probably. I don't know of any, I don't know actually of any military person who likes a war. I think it's just what we're, what, what you're employed to do. Yep. Uh, so I'd like to remind everybody who may if you've enjoyed this video, please go to the uh, description and um, click on either subscribe to our channel or subscribe to Wings Magazine or subscribe to the Air Force Association New South Wales. Thanks, John. I have no doubt we'll trip over each other again. And um, thank you very much for your participation. Sure, Ringo. Thanks, mate. Welcome.